Ladies and gentlemen, what is going on? This is the start of a brand new series. This is Cash Game Mastery. I'm going to be going through sessions of 200 Zoom that I've played in this series. I'm going to be documenting my thought process in each and every spot that comes up. There is no stone that's going to be left unturned. You're going to get gradually immersed in how I think about the game, how I apply theory, how I deviate from it to gain extra EV and reality, how I adjust to strong regulars, weaker players, outright maniacs, all different kinds of spots that come up in real life. This is basically a how-to guide. It's going to be a long, sort of consistent grind where you guys get gradually familiarized with how we should be thinking about the game. Let's get started. First hand here, we have King Six. We're even going to talk about hands that look a little bit standard or common because these are some of the best spots to actually increase our win rate in. Highly instructional series this one is going to be. So Jack-10-8, the first two things I'm going to do when I see this flop is decide on my frequency and my sizing. So my frequency for betting here is going to be, well, let's do the sizing first because it does in part determine the bet frequency. I'm going to go small on this flop and it's basically due to my nut uniqueness test. The nut uniqueness test or nut, note how the nut uniqueness test also spells nut, is basically to subject my opponent's range to an examination where I basically decide do they have enough combos of nutted stuff to render my over pairs kind of rubbish or lackluster or are they breaking enough here that my over pairs are still thriving i think it's quite clear on jack 10 8 that our opponent sort of passes the nut uniqueness test or we our range doesn't pass the nut uniqueness test here the kings the aces the queens those hands that we have they're not nutted even sets aren't nutted although they're very strong villain does have lots of combos of things like queen 9 9 7 10 8 jack 8 jack 10, pocket 8s, etc. So when the nut advantage is kind of a bit more equally spread between the two ranges, we're going to go ahead and use a small bet. This is still a favourable board for our range. This is not a bad situation for us just because we don't have that nutted advantage as, as much as we normally would. Doesn't mean that we can't bet semi-frequently. I'd be betting about 60-70% of the time here, globally speaking, with my range. My hand is going to bet more than that because it's a polarised hand and it's got a lot of backdoor potential. It's just a hand that doesn't have a terribly good check EV. What you don't want to do in this spot is bet all of the draws that have better bet EV than others. It doesn't work like that. You should be comparing the EV of betting to the EV of checking. And if you think your hand is like quite a lousy check, it doesn't need to be a very good bet in order for it to be chosen as a C bet at high frequencies. So this is definitely one that we want to go ahead and bet often. So we do. Villain thinks for a little while, I don't know anything about this player, and then calls. The Nine of Hearts may send a sort of shock factor through you when you see this turn, you might be a little bit repulsed or discouraged, it's a very normal human reaction to the fact that your opponent now just has a straight, millions of combos of the time. The thing is though that their range is really wide, they can still have Ace-8, King-8, Ace-10, King-10, they can have a hand like Jack-5 suited, Jack-6 suited, they have a lot of one pair, they can have some other hands as well like pocket sixes or something that, that peeled one. This is definitely not a spot we need to be like afraid of bluffing in. Yes, it's not a great card for range, it does further decimate the EV of things like aces, kings, top set, second set from the flop. However, it does put our opponent in a spot where they're still going to have a lot of check folds here. The thing to do when your opponent has tons of straights and then tons of really weak one pair hands is to not use a giant bet. So the thing I would stay away from here is overbetting. This sizing is more than good enough, we're not going to make a straight indifferent. Even if we overbet, we are going to make one pair indifferent with the sizing that we chose. Therefore, we want to reduce as much of our opponent's range towards zero EV as we can where they're indifferent to calling and folding. And the way to do that here is not to use a big bet. That would be overkill, it would be wasteful. We'd be burning more money against the Queen X region without achieving much against the one pair. There isn't a hell of a lot of stuff in between. A lot of two pair, set of eights, etc. is going to raise the flop. Nines is going to raise pre-flop. Villain's range is quite polar on the turn, so keep your sizing down. You can bet some hands that are a bit weaker than King-6 here, but certainly this flush draw is a very high frequency, if not mandatory turn C bet. Some other hands that will be betting sometimes here that are a bit weaker would just be naked King-X, particularly with a heart. Maybe Ace-X with the Ace of Hearts. Hands like this could also be lower EV bluffs. I would stay away from bluffing stuff like Ace-4 of Spades on this note. It's not that good a spot for range that we want to do that. This hand is a pretty exploitable one, exploitative one, same thing. Whenever you exploit someone, you're also exploitable in theory, in principle. Doesn't mean you're going to get exploited. We ISO here when a weaker player limps. This is close, very near the bottom of my ISO range preflop here. I wouldn't be over the moon about making this raise, but I think usually there's enough of a skill discrepancy or skill edge in our favour, if I may be arrogant for a moment. I think we do want to go ahead and make these raises as light as we can get away with. We have to remember the player in the big blind can pick up on this in the long term and can start, you know, three betting us lighter 
and stuff like that, something to be conscious of. Going small on King King 6, because again, the nut test, the nut uniqueness test says that my aces, my queens, my jacks, these sort of hands, my tens, they're not that strong. If Philan just has one king, then he's going to leapfrog all of those hands, so I keep my sizing down against what is a more polarized range on King King 6 than it would be on some other boards, like 8 5 Deuce, for example, and you don't want to bet big into polarized ranges. So we also note the villain's flop timing here is really quite striking. Just have a look at this again. This is on 1x speed. I've not sped this up. So have a look at the moment here where we see bet. Villain calls after about a second. What that's going to do is it's going to merge their range. They're unlikely to have absolutely nothing. So they're unlikely to be getting totally out of line here and calling like, I don't know, the jack four of diamonds on the flop. But it has, it's possible, I guess. But what's way more likely is the villain has a six ace high that's decent. Pocket sevens, pocket eights, like mergey type hands of this nature. Pocket fours, the list goes on. Against a range that's more mergy than normal, that's more mediocre than normal, the thing that we want to do to exploit that is not check so much, but actually just value bet aggressively, because I think it's very likely that Villain has some kind of mediocre to bad hand here. I just opt to go block block. That means I'm going to bet turn small, and I'm going to bet river small as well. This means if we do run into a king, we're going to kind of limit our losses, hopefully, while also increasing the frequency that we get paid off by these under pairs to the board. I don't think Villain will have a queen very often there, so our main job is just to choose a line in a vacuum that's going to net us the most EV, and I think small bet on the turn is great for that. We don't have to be building like a consistent arsenal of bet sizes there. We don't have to be like, okay, normally I would use this size in this spot, so I'm handcuffed, I have to do that. That's not how it works. Actually, here we can do whatever the hell we want. We can build a bet size against this weaker player in this isolated pot that we wouldn't normally have against the reg. There's no problem building double barrel for one third pot into our game, especially out of position anyway. And it's especially good to do that when you're targeting some kind of very mergy, weak sort of range. By the way, targeting is a word I usually hate. The only reason I'm okay with it here, just if you're watching this thinking, Pete, you hypocrite, what are you saying targeting for? The reason I'm okay with it is that Villain's range is massively weighted towards mergy stuff at this point. So I think it's okay to target mediocre hands when Villain has tons of them. What you can't do, because you always want to like target your opponent's range in some way, right? You always want to be like playing with that in mind. What you don't want to do is just pick a very small chunk of Villain's range and say, we're targeting this, so we do this. That's, that's not okay. That's just tunnel vision. I'm okay with targeting if it's used in the right way. Okay, Ace-10 offsuit. Go ahead and open here, we get cold called. Like I said, we are going to talk about every spot, even if it's a little bit humdrum and kind of boring. So this flop spot, we're going to be checking with this hand. This is a fairly mediocre hand. We don't have the ace that's any kind of backdoor that's suited here. We just have like a very medium strength, lousy hand that blocks the folding ranges of our opponents and doesn't perform amazingly well as a c-bet. Could you c-bet this hand? Ostensibly, yes. I don't know that it's okay, I'm just going to check and in a multi-way pot where I've opened cutoff, I need to remember that I'm actually further down my range than I would be normally and my hand has less showdown value than it would normally as well because I'm multi-way. So this bluff with the 10 of hearts out eater, eating up the outs here with kind of two live cards against pocket pairs with blockers to some ace jack and with some nice redraw in the form of pair draw, I just decide to go ahead and bluff this node. I think on average this checking range will be a bit underprotected, although the stronger players will do a better job of just sort of checking all the time here. And I think this flop checking range will be really underprotected. There won't be a whole lot of 9x in it or things like that that are auto calling. There won't be any like real trips in it or boats in it. So I think this bluff here performs a little bit better in reality than it does in theory. This is a bluff. It's not uncommon though that like, this player calls king queen and then river goes check check or something because they don't understand how to bluff or they think king queen is showdown value. On the river I don't really think this is the combo to barrel with. I have blockers to some folding range like ace 10 of hearts for example and yeah I just don't really want to have a heart here. I think I want to be more sort of unblocking a villain's folding range here if I'm going to go ahead and bet. I don't even manage to block jack 10 suited here because I have the 10 of hearts and that's impossible, right? They can only have jack 10 of clubs, diamonds or spades. So I think this particular combo, now that I've done my exploit against the weaker player, I've landed in a spot against the regular, I don't really have an exploit anymore here. I just want to bluff selectively. This is not a good world for my range. It's really not. It's the kind of situation where my range has got its fold equity on the turn. Now we land on the river, it's not that there's no fold equity, but there's not like a surplus or excess of fold equity compared to what there would be mathematically. So the average bluff in this spot for me, I should expect to break even and maybe actually lose if villain is over defending and thinks I'm over bluffing, which I think is kind of likely. But I think I need to just remember that certain hands will be plus EV to bluff with here, others won't. And yeah, I would like to have certain more favorable blockers in order to, to fire this river a bit. 
So we give up, we lose the Queen Jack. Some money saved there, I think. Pick up Pocket King is going to cold 4 bet here. You don't actually have to make your cold 4 bet very huge in these spots at all. The reason being, like, villains just going to have a really hard time dealing with this range anyway. They're going to have a lot of auto shoves and auto folds in their range. So going kind of on the small size here, I think, is small side here is fine. We get to this flop, which is actually low and blank and harmless enough that in a 4 bet pot where villain has already filtered by 3 betting pre, this is not a board that concerns us. We need to be a bit careful here because if we follow the normal pattern of Razor versus Collar, we might glance at 6-5 deuce and think this is a horrible flop for the Razor, a really good board for the Collar. That does not apply here in a 4 bet pot because people aren't 3 betting pre with 3-4 suited, 6-5 suited, that often 6-5s, deuces, these hands are very rare guests if they they're ever present at all in the 3-bet range of the cutoff player. Thus, when we get to this 3-bet pot, those hands are just basically paling into insignificance. Therefore, this is a board on which we have a very big nut advantage. Our range is still doing pretty well. Blank boards tend to be good for the 3-better. We'd rather it was it was paired like 5 deuce deuce. That's even better still, because we have boat redraw against flush draws. We have basically an over pair that can crush like a, a turned and river 2 pair with king jack or something. And yeah, the paired board is a bit better still, but this is still a situation where I'd use 3rd pot or even half pot here at high frequency. You can also check this hand if you want. I actually pressed the wrong hotkey here, I think. I pressed the one instead of the four number pad thingy, and it made a bet that's a little bit too small for this spot. I don't think this is a disaster or anything, but yeah, quarter pot is best reserved for boards that are a bit more polarizing to villain, where there's a high card or a meaningfully high pair, or, the, or it's monotone, or something like that. I think we can use a, a bit of a bigger sizing there because our nutted region is just so, so strong. So these hands are going to come thick and fast. We have a6 suited here in the cutoff. We open, we get peeled by the big blind player. Jack 7-6, this is the board I'm going to be mainly using big bets on. When I bet, I think checking back the 6 here is fine. I can also do this, and this is an exploit I use against a certain type of recreational player, namely a passive one, who I think is not going to do a great job of leading turn at high frequency, and therefore I just opt to get a little bit of... It's a multi-purpose bet. I get a bit of denial here, protection. I also gain some value because on some branches of the game tree i actually like backdoor a flush i make trips i make two pair maybe i get called by worse and actually show down and win with a pair of sixes because villain calls it king six or six five or pocket fives so there are many good things that can happen when i make this bet on the flop it's kind of multi-purpose we're not yet in the realm where i have to like pull out and only be betting for really thick value or as a bluff that would happen as we get further into the hand and indeed on the turn here we're already in this kind of world where I don't want to be betting this hand. This hand is mediocre, it's medium equity, it's about 60% pot share or something like that. Maybe less actually, maybe on the 8th it's only like 50 or 45. But the pot share of this hand is a healthy chunk, but it's not a value betting candidate. It's not a hand that if we shovel money into the pot with here and get called that we're in particularly great shape. Therefore, betting this hand is a polarization error. You know this mistake from from losing to cruising, right? Mark's made this mistake a couple of times. No offense, Mark, if you're watching, but yeah, we've all met polarization errors before on this YouTube channel. Villain checks to us and we check back. Queen of Hearts in the river. Typically speaking, when I have checked back the turn, I don't incorporate an overbet strategy into my game on the river. The reasons for this are very simple. I have a capped range. I would have pure bet the turn with 10-9 or a set here. Therefore, it's very hard for me to have those hands. I can have some flushes, but if my opponent is playing the correct tricky, trappy, out of position way, then theoretically so can they. In practice, people will lead their flushes much more often than they're supposed to on this node, and that probably does reopen the door exploitatively for an overbet. The thing is, I'm not overly convinced that overbetting is actually the highest EV bet size here for value. I can see it causing a bit of a sudden spike in fold equity on such a card where villain has a lot of jack x, 7x, 6x, 8x kind of combos in their range. So typically we shouldn't try to maximize the amount of the time we're called. We should maximize our overall EV. And usually that means betting as big as possible. But here, just given the way the board is going, I'm not convinced overbet is great for value here. I just opt to make a B75. I get called. I don't know what villain had. You'll never know. You won't sleep tonight. Ace Queen of Diamonds, we go for a 3 bet small blind versus button, button makes the peel. We check flop here, we could also bet, I think using small bets on this flop makes some sense. I think big bets make some sense as well, the nut uniqueness test kind of says, yeah our over pairs are still good but they're not amazing and so I think it's kind of ambiguous which size is better here on the flop, I think you can do a couple of different things. It's also not a flop we want to bet very often. As textures go, 986 Rainbow is one of the worst textures for the small line range, and as such we're going to be playing a high checking frequency, checking most hands most of the time. Maybe we can build some bets here with 
a polarized range sometimes. Ace Queen can bet here. I have no doubt that it's not an EV loss to bet this hand because although it looks fairly mediocre, we do have backdoor diamonds. We have very nutty kind of or semi nutty pair draw outs here. And yeah, this hand has a good mix of useful fold equity, denial. We can bluff in the sense that we can make villain fold other Ace Queen combos here that have a lot of equity, maybe even like fours folds here if he has that. So I think there's an element of bluff, an element of denial, and some element of like value where we backdoor stuff or hit a pair on a turn and win a big pot that's all going our way here. So certainly we can bet this hand, we can bet it big, we can bet it small. I roll a check this time, I'm kind of using RNG. When I face half pot, I think I'm super indifferent. I think I can probably call here, but I'm not sure. I think I can definitely mix raise here and I think I can fold. I think I just rolled this again and opted to fold this time and that's perfectly okay I believe on this texture. It wouldn't be okay to fold this hand if the board was a bit drier. Like if it was 9-8 deuce I don't think I can let Ace Queen of Diamonds go. I have to either bet check raise or check call. But I think on this particular texture with the connectedness and villain's range just having way more outs against we went behind being more nutted more often I think we can go ahead and just fold that hand sometimes. But I do think it's an incredibly sort of break even three way indifferent spot where all of our actions are incredibly close to one another. Any and that's going to happen guys you know you're going to get spots where all of your actions are super close and there's just not really a lot of way of telling between them same player here four bets us big blind against cutoff you can jam this hand at the time i wasn't sure that villain was a regular yet i just hadn't seen them before i think later it transpired that they probably were and if this is a regular you can for sure jam ace four suited it's probably about a break even play we are deeper than normal though, that puts me off, that makes me think it may be slightly losing here. And also the fact that I didn't know villain was a regular just meant I wanted to stay away from that play. So I pondered here a little bit, eventually just decided to fold the hand. You can probably jam this, I think Peel is slightly losing, like to call here. Jam is probably like break even if you're 100 BBs deep, it's just one of those spots. One thing that you are allowed to do, contrary to popular 50NL reg opinion, is flat things. Look at this, you can flat here. Can you believe it? It's not just whales that flat pre. When you get checked to by a preflop raiser, also we should note this table is full of weaker players. I don't know about flow water actually, that might be an erroneous tag, but these two I think are recreational. Could be wrong. Again, if you're watching this and you're like, oh, I'm not recreational, why did he say I'm recreational player? I'm not recreational player, oh, you, you idiot. You idiot carrot fuck. Like if you're gonna say that, just understand that I'm tagging people provisionally. I have to be a little bit careful that I do assign tags when it's highly likely that someone is recreational so that I can use that information. I don't want to wait for 100% accuracy before I tag you. So if you do get caught in the wrong net there, so to speak, it's not a personal attack on you or your buddy or that guy you respect that plays high stakes. You need to just move on. You need to get over it. You really need to get over it, okay? One of the most popular comments I get is like, this guy's not a, not a fish. What's wrong? It's like the most common thing I get. It's crazy. That's the thing people feel the need to talk about in the chat, huh? We go for small bet here. Why should you small bet the spot in general? The reason you should small bet the spot is that your opponent here is going to be polar. They're going to be checking very often, if not with range. If you have any doubt about this, look it up in a solver. Look it up in, in Pile Solver, GTO Wizard, whatever you use. You will see that the out of position range is typically in bad shape on boards that don't contain kings specifically kings king is the the card that bails them out the most and there are reasons for that i won't go into it too heavily but on this board villain probably could build some small betting range it's not the worst board for them but there is a seven and a five that's two set makers three set makers in fact Chats can also slow play pre here. So this is a pretty grim spot for our opponent. They're meant to check a lot. They're meant to check protected and they're meant to check raises fairly often when we bet here. Therefore, we do not need to bet big if we're getting check raised a lot, like for value. We don't have that nut at a hand because villain is checking over pair. So it's not like if we're the preflop raiser and we have all the queens through aces, we can build a big bet. It's them that has that here, not us. Therefore, we build a small bet. We can bet often here. Our range is doing well. Our nutted region is sparse. We don't have a lot of nuts compared to villain. We only have sets. They have sets and over pairs. So need to be a bit careful here that we separate sizing and frequency and understand that while our range is happy, that doesn't mean it wants to bet big. Common misconception there to, to muddle those things up. Here's a kind of silly spot, so 7-3-3, ace-4 with ace of clubs, this is definitely a hand you can go ahead and bet with here, like overall, globally speaking, your range wouldn't have a high bet frequency on this texture, but you could build some bets, I think this hand is one that bets way more often than the average hand. The ace is kind of flimsy with showdown value, though it does admittedly have some uncertain runouts. The backdoor straight draw is helpful, the ace of clubs is 
very much pushing us towards the bet camp a little bit. That said, I still think it's like an optional bet against the regular, and I don't know whether to make it or not. I'm not sure who this player is, by the way. They may be a reg, they may not be. On the turn, the question is, is Ace High now low enough down in our range that we can start bluffing? I think we possibly can bet here, because although this hand is typically in the showdown value quadrant of our range, the Ace of Clubs just makes us a little bit more inclined to make that bet. The reason for that is that we will block the check call and check raise club hands in villain's range and we will also eat up some of the outs such that if villain has jack 10 of clubs here and check calls the turn and we hit an ace on the river we will actually suck out and then we can't hit the ace of clubs on the river giving them a flush and coolering us if we have it in our hand so kind of nice to have the club here i think the club will bet this version of ace 4 will bet but like diamonds or spades won't look it up in the solver let me know if i'm wrong that's my understanding of the spot but I think you can also check this hand. I don't think it's a mandatory turn C bet, and I think I opt to check this time. If I could have a redo of this hand, I'd probably just bet the turn. And that's because I think River is going to get led a lot in a way where I'm not so happy continuing. What happens in the hand is not something I was anticipating happening often, where Villain actually goes for this kind of crazy... It's not actually crazy. I mean, it makes some sense. Like, 3x pot. River lead. Because I didn't know if this was a regular and they looked like a recreational player, I opted just to fold here. Like, if a recreational ever does this against you, you need to get the hell out of there. Like, you need to turn around and run and drop your cards on the floor. Like, don't even sit at the table and fold. Just run out of the card room. Yeah, if this ever happens to you live, that's the, the optimal response. So we do just that. I mean, for a minute, I have some crazy thoughts about, like, okay, maybe I can just call this bluff catcher because I have the ace of clubs. But then I thought, but hold on a minute, he's probably choosing the Ace of Clubs as his bluff for this sizing, so blocking it seems pretty awful actually. I think Fold is, is the way to go in that spot, for sure. King Queen on King Jack 8 Rainbow, you want to range bet these boards, they're extremely good for your range and you want to use a small size because Villain is a bit more polar there between like Broadway stuff that connected well and Underpair that got demolished, so you can just bet small into that more polarised range. You see how villain's range polarization is always kind of at the core of my bet size choices, right? This is a very common thing. I don't think there are that many more interesting hands, actually. 10, 5, 3, this was the last one. I'm going to actually switch over to the other table in a minute, and I'll show you a few more hands before we wrap up. This one I went for a large bet because 10, 5, 3 passes the nut test. My nuts are unique. They are preserved. They are, the strength of them is preserved. They are only in my range, not in villains, because villain has no combos of jacks plus here, really. And we do, and therefore we can go ahead and use large C bets on 10, 5, 3. It's not because it's a flush draw. That's not the thing I was talking about this in a coaching session, a private session yesterday with a student, and he was kind of saying, well, I, I bet big whenever there's a flush draw and that's like a little bit of it but the main reason you actually choose big c bets on the flop is based on your nut prevalence and and whether those nutted hands that are unique to your range are still really strong or whether they've been devalued okay let's switch over to the other table do let me know what you think about this fast-paced, furious hand review. I hope that you like the session format. The idea is to bring you guys a lot of these so you can really get into the habit, as I say once again, of understanding how a strong player approaches poker in real time. I'm trying not to spend ages on these hands because I really just want to show you how it would go with 10, 15, 20 seconds to think, right? What are the cogs of the machinery? Okay, 8-9, this is an interesting hand. So Villain goes ahead and bets flop here a bit bigger than normal. This half pot sizing, usually I would equate this to a weaker player, not because there's anything wrong with half potting this texture. There absolutely isn't, you can do this. The reason I'd equate this to a weaker player more often than not is simply that it's not really a common thing that regs do. They tend to bet one third here or maybe they tend to bet B75. Not many regs will half pot. So it's more just an empirical thing. I could be wrong, it's not an ironclad read by any means. I think against that sizing, bottom two pair probably could raise or call. I wouldn't build as many raises against that size as I would against one third. Against one third, I'd probably raise the hand more often than not. Against that size, I'd probably call more often than I would raise. Just trying to keep things in line a little bit with my global raise frequency for my range and not getting too out of whack. Villain goes ahead and bets turn here, and I think this is just a very, very standard easy call. There's just no way that we have the equity to raise here, and folding is of course absurd with a hand that beats value bets and bluffs. The king comes in the river, completely wrecks our hand strength, although we do still have a very nice bluff catcher, and Villain actually goes for a line that's really interesting. So Villain's sizing here is super rare, like you don't normally see people bet big on the turn and then one third the king river. The kinds of hands that should do this are stuff like ace jack, maybe some king x, although a lot of king x could bet bigger here, pocket aces, that sort of thing. If this is a recreational player, I think they can also merge this with like queens or 9x or something sometimes like some hand that has no business betting may accidentally bet here if they're a recreational 
If they're a reg, it'll be a more well-constructed range and there may even be some bluffs in it. I would highly expect that Big Bet, Big Bet, Small Bet is a very underbluffed node. While villains should only be bluffing like a fifth of the time for the sizing, I actually think it's likely that they're bluffing less often than that. I think this is a, a pretty unbluffed situation. And given that we actually block some of the biggest hands in villains range here, the king nine and the king eight, right, they're going to want to do that. And this is an underbluffed spot. I think I no longer like calling, but now I like raising more because our blockers are really good. But I also like raising more for the other reason, which is that I don't think Villain is going to do a great job of throwing really strong value bets into this range. Like if Villain has a hand like Queen 10, Jacks, Nines or Eights, I don't really expect them to pick the sizing on the river very often. One hand that they could do this with is King 9 because it heavily blocks my range or King 8 because it heavily blocks my continuance range. And that's exactly why I want to raise here with a 9 and an 8 blocker. The other hand that I can't do much about here that Villain may do this with is King Jack or Pocket Kings. If they have one of those hands, then fair play to them. They're just going to go ahead and pillage me for lots of money. But I do decide to build the racing range here and I decide to build it around the King 8 and King 9 of my range. So I make it nice and large on the river here, kind of like a pot size raise. You could even go bigger than this, ostensibly, but I think there's actually some slow play, like, not slow play, but like, you know, quad kings king jack and villains range here as well sometimes so we maybe want to be a little bit more careful than going all in unfortunately it looks like we've run into the top of villains range here i think having a three bit jam bluff range on the river here is just basically something that no human is ever good enough to do or, or even wants to do it's just like a kind of kamikaze crazy play that maybe a solver would make sometimes but yeah i expect that to be an unbluffed node I have absolutely no inclination to bluff catch the 8-9 it's not even clear that i beat villains bluffs anymore wherever they may be with that hand, so very clear pitch. This hand is sort of what I was talking about earlier, where we actually have a board like Queen 8, 10. This is a situation I'm not going to range bet, I'm going to use small sizes again because it's kind of like gappy 3 straight and the nuts are not that preserved in my range. And this hand I'm going to mix bet and check, I check this time this delayed c-bet node here. This ace high is actually much lower down than the one we saw earlier because this is cut off against big blind where my range is stronger, not button, so this is further down my range, it's a bit less showdown value relative to the rest of my range than what would be the case on the button, so I think betting there with the gutter and that, that sort of bad ace high is actually totally fine, and at your guys' stakes, if you play like 25 NL or something, you'll have so much fold equity on that turn, it's not even funny, it's a very classic exploitative situation where you can just gain tons of EV by over bluffing, and so I do have a preference for bet there against weaker players or if I'm playing against a regular lower stakes. I decided to make a bit of a cheeky defend here with the Queen 9. If you like this format by the way, do smash that like button, let me know in the comments so I know to make more of these videos, very important you guys let me know what you like, because this channel is basically generated, the content of this channel is generated by the stuff that you guys show interest in, that's how it works. It's like my own little algorithm that goes on in my brain, it's deciding to make the content that you guys like most. So this is a spot where weaker players, blue tags, I mean anyone that's called poker 139, 9581, I mean there must be a weaker player, right? There's just no two ways about it. You will not see a reg dead with a screen name, guys, you really won't. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and raise the flop here, like every single time. Because this is a board that people see bet too often on. This is not a board you get to bet all the time on, but many of the sort of weaker players here that do see bet small will be overdoing it. That said, like in theory, it's an okay raise. It's not like a bad, bad raise in theory. You can make this raise for sure, I think. And therefore, I don't even think it's a big deviation to just decide to always raise it. The four is a really good card for a range. Like we're gonna have stuff like eight, five suited, five, three suited. We're gonna have things like six, four, seven, four suited. Raising flop here is hybrid hands for denial, value and bluff all rolled into one. So this is a card that we're going to connect with really frequently. It's going to increase the EV of our bluffing range. We still have tons of the sets like eight, nine, sevens sorry eight nine is not a set but we have straights like eight nine sets like sixes sevens and tens and yeah like this is this turn has improved our bluffs while not helping our opponents bottom of their range the bottom of our opponent's range for calling flop was like king queen suited queen jack suited with a backdoor this has not been helped by the four but our bad stuff on the flop has that's why this is such a great card for range and it's one that we want to aggress on at a really high frequency I use slight overbet on this node because as you'll note the SBR is kind of coming down a little bit here meaning there's quite a lot of money in the pot already but there's not that much and therefore we do want to overbet the pot here but we don't need to make it like 2x pot. Building folds, happy days, I hope you have enjoyed this video, I've certainly enjoyed making it, it's a cool fast paced format, go back and watch it again, I flew through lots of stuff but yeah don't worry if you didn't take everything in, I'm not trying to get you to follow every word, I'm trying to immerse you 
by exposure into the way I think about the game. Let me know what you think in the comments, smash the like button, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and we'll see you soon for more poker content at Carrot Corner Poker Education. Bye for now guys.